What is up, everybody? Mr. Purtis here. Welcome to topic 2.5 and 2.6. You're getting two for one today. What a deal. This is on cultural and environmental consequences of all of this connectivity. Connectivity meaning all this different trade, all this different interaction. What impact is it having outside of just growth of cities? People are increasing trade, new products, new innovations. What's going on overall globally, or at least in Afro-Eurasia, Africa, Europe, and Asia to have this? As always, this is circa, and not as always, this is it. This is the end of circa 1200 to 1450. This is the last video for unit two. Unit one, unit two, about 16 to 20% of the total exams. This is about, a, we're gonna be about a fifth of the way through the curriculum stuff. Again, this should be review from last year. A lot of this stuff, hopefully, fingers crossed, will be familiar. So here's the deal. Humans in the environment, there's that theme again. This is one of the key in AP world. And this is one of those things I just want you to keep back in your mind somewhere. Increase in trade equals interaction of people. Interaction of people equals new ideas and the spread of diseases. So the good side of this increase in trade and increase in interaction is you get a whole bunch of new ideas. It could be cultural ideas, it could be ideas about products, food, advances, new technology, any of that stuff. But usually with that, as more people interact, you're gonna have diseases that are gonna spread as well. So we're gonna see a couple things. One, I just wanna make sure we're clear on this, with new people and this new interaction comes new food. And generally, if new food is easy to grow, that means that you're gonna have people with filled bellies. And when people's bellies are filled, they are happy, and when people's bellies are filled and they're happy, they're more likely to have children. And those children will now survive and won't die at a young age because the parents couldn't feed them. And there's really two examples, there's lots of examples, but two examples during this time period of new food. One is champa rice. This champa rice is gonna come from Vietnam and from Southern China, and it's gonna push into Northern China, and it's gonna be the one that I mentioned back when we talked about China, I think it was 1.1, wow, it was a long time ago, um, is gonna be able to be grown twice a season. So that increase in rice leads to increase in population. Also, we're gonna see the spread of bananas. Maybe like, you might be like, bananas, come on, bro, really, just bananas? But seriously, think about it. Bananas, if it's easy to grow in tropical climates and it's easy to eat, I guess, and it's a way to fill your stomach. Bananas generally are relatively filling. These are gonna spread from Southeast Asia into Africa, and into the islands and eventually into the Americas. But bananas are native to this area, Southeast Asia, right here. Also, the disease that's gonna spread is the big one. Everyone knows the bubonic plague, AKA the Black Death. Called the Black Death because people in Europe referred to it as that because their skin would begin to rot away. And as the skin rotted away, it would turn like charcoal black. And it char turned charcoal black because the skin was decaying. It smelled horrible, it was gross. The Latin word for this and the Latin term for this is the bubonic plague. Bubonic, same thing, right? So black death, bubonic plague, same thing. Bubonic refers to, the root of that word is bubos. Bubos refers to bump. And the first sign that you had the black death, the bubonic plague, was the flea bite. Um, and then around that flea bite, that bump would turn, would be a ring. It would be around the rosy part. And then people would stuff their noses and their pockets full of posies until ashes, ashes, they all fell down. But this has been around for about a thousand years. This isn't like, oh, this new disease came around in the 1300s. Nah, man, there'd been waves and waves of the bubonic plague that had come for thousands of a thousand years um, throughout Afro-Eurasia. Afro in the 1300s, this wave is going to really spread during the Mongol rule across the Silk Road. So this Silk Road trade that had been increasing under the Mongols and brought all these new ideas and new inventions also brings the Black Death with it. So it pretty much starts in the 1320s in China and it comes all the way across here by the 1340s and into Europe and eventually into France by 1347. So we're talking about a 20 year, 26 year period across this area. About 60% of Western Europeans are gonna perish as a result of this and about 50% in China. In terms of total population, definitely more in China because the population was just larger in China because it was much more a center of trade and Europe was still relatively isolated at this point. Um, but about 60% of Europeans, each area it hit along this entire stretch, usually about 40 to 70% of the population. That is insane if you think about a disease ravaging 40 to 70%, four out of every 10 to seven out of every 10 people 
dying from a disease. You would have known multiple people if you lived during this time who would have died. And the knowledge of this, again, there's that image again. This is a little map here, our little chart of the population of China from 200 BCE all the way through about 1700. And you can see this is the population growth of China, mainly from that Champa rice we were talking about. Um, you can see this huge bump from maybe about 25 million people up to almost 100 million. You can see this little decrease here. That's from the Mongol invasion. And then you got this increase up to about 100 million. That's a huge increase. That's from 25 million to 100 million. That's four times the population. And then you can see the drop here from about 100 million down to maybe 60 million, give or take. These are all rough estimates. And you can see it increase again and then decrease. So we got all kinds of uh, population numbers. Here's another one. This is Europe from about 1,000. You can see it reached about 85 million. These are all estimates. There was no census back then. And then it drops down to about 60 million. And then it takes them all the way until the mid 1500s to reach that number again over 200 years to bring it back, that population back up. And then the population takes off. Another story for another day. Um, people in Europe especially had very little knowledge of how to prevent and stop the bubonic plague. There's no knowledge of diseases and germs. It's, we're very, uh, very much like vengeful God has brought this upon us. Um, this is probably the most famous image, which is of a doctor. Um, they believe that if you put flowers inside this beak here and put red rubies on your eyes, it would stop you from getting the plague. Didn't work. Um, they also did what was called bloodletting. There was a belief in many cultures at this time that if you cut open a vein and you let yourself bleed out, the bad disease blood would come out and the rest of the blood inside would still be good. Um, also, there were people who were Catholics who believed that God was punishing them and that the only way to stop the plague was to punish themselves. So these guys, not just these two, there were more than them, would go around. They were called the flagellants. Flagellants. They would whip themselves in towns um, and march from town to town doing chants and whatnot. Um, and they believed that God would, would like that. Uh, in retrospect, it probably helped the disease spread more because they were, as they were hitting themselves, blood was spreading everywhere and they were bringing the disease most likely with them. And then last but not least, uh, they also, there was many towns in Western Europe believe that the Jewish people were causing this, even though Jewish people died at the same rate as Christians. Some reason the Christians thought that the Jewish people were doing it and that they were poisoning the wells of Christian people. So they would go into towns and kill all the Jewish people in that town. Um, and that's what this images of right here. So none of them were right. Uh, mostly spread most likely by fleas. Um, and then the flea would jump off from one host to another. So that's the negative side. Let's talk about some cultural stuff. So we got some cultural development interaction, a whole bunch of new innovations that spread. That's really the, one of the big themes here of this, these two first units, cultural traditions. We're going to see Buddhism is going to spread in East Asia. We talked about this in the China one, but I'm just trying to connect it back here, which is Zen Buddhism or Chen Buddhism. We also see Islam spreading to Sub-Saharan Africa, just like to show you how things change and syncretize. This is the Indian Buddha here, skinny. This is the Chinese Buddha here. Generally, the I'm supposed to rub his belly for good luck, traditionally, um, but that's the Chinese Buddha here. This is an example, as we talked about in class at this point, of Islamic architecture in West Africa. You can tell based on the almost dirt slash clay building here. Um, also, we're going to see a lot of technological and scientific innovations outside of the ones that we've already talked about. Compass, astrolabe, ship making, all that good stuff. We're also going to see paper. Uh, the creation of paper started in the Han Dynasty back in around circa 100 CE. And it's going to spread to the rest of the East during this time period up into Western Europe in the 13, 14, 15, 1600s. Um, also, we're going to see gunpowder spread from China. Um, I'm, I know we talked about this in class, but I do just want to point out again, it's the first explosive in history, something that you set on fire and it explodes. Um, the people who created it were alchemists. Uh, these were people who basically tried to manipulate chemistry and um, different minerals in order to try and find immortality. The irony of this is the first guy who created gunpowder and discovered it, who was trying to find immortality for himself, probably killed himself. Um, and this is going to spread during the Mongols to the Middle East. Also, we're going to see some explorers during this time. Outside of just Zheng He, a.k.a. Zheng He, we got Marco Polo, um, who is going to travel from Venice here and is going to travel between 1271 and 1295. And he actually travels to 
the Yuan Dynasty under the Mongol rule and live there for a time. Um, so he's going to travel all the way across. When he gets back, he's going to write books or a book about his travels. And it's going to – people are going to read it. Not many because – majority of people are illiterate still but the small percentage they can are going to read it and it's going to inspire people to kind of go out and explore to check out these lands that they <clears throat> haven't really heard about because they've been living in isolated self-sufficient areas in western europe so it's going to inspire that but you can see he's really traveling along the silk road here down along the indian ocean um and up into the mediterranean sea using the trade routes trade routes trade routes trade routes and also we have ibn Battuta. um he is from the middle east he is totally self-funded he is not sponsored by a government um, he's just going to travel on his own. He actually starts at 20, which makes me feel like I've done nothing with my life, but that's neither here nor there. Um, he actually takes a couple different, he travels a couple different times and he's really going to focus his attention on, um, going to Islamic areas and trying to learn how Islam is practiced in different ways and trying to discover this. And he goes all the way up into, into China here, down along the Indian ocean, um, across the sub-Saharan trade, kind of one side note to his stories. Um, there's one story of him coming to Timbuktu and he now traditionally in the Islamic empire and in the Middle East, uh, men and women are not really allowed to be alone together unless you're married or unless you're related. And he comes into his host family's house and I believe Timbuktu and the man essentially says to him, I'm going to leave. You want to hang out here with my wife? And Ibn Battuta writes that he was mortified that this Muslim family wanted to leave him alone with this woman and he was just horrified by it but it shows how that story kind of shows how islam as it spreads is going to be practiced differently in west africa than it is in the middle east than it is going to be in down here in malacca and in indonesia but again his exploration is going to inspire more people to explore again we, he's around the same time as marco polo so we're going to see these explorers go and going to inspire more people to explore and more people to trade and more people to find ideas even though all of this bad stuff is going to happen like the Black Death, the bubonic plague. So that's what I got. That's consequences, environmental issues. That's the end of Unit 2. Wow, that just flew by. Um, as always, any questions, any concerns, any comments, write it down. Let me know. I'm out.